Welcome to At Home and Abroad with Harrison Walker. Join us each week as we explore the far reaches of the globe in search of unique characters and stories to share. Reach beyond your front door as we uncover new perspectives, intriguing ideas, and lessons learned over time. Let's jump in. Seeing isn't always believing. As they say, this is very true for two charming pastel painted cottages in Gland, Switzerland, not far from Geneva. Villa Rose and Villa Verte look ready to host an idyllic country stay, identical but for the green and pink paint, but looks can be deceiving. Built in World War II, these sweet little cottages were false fronts to hide the defensive weaponry hidden inside. As a neutral country during World War II, the Swiss still felt the need to protect themselves from possible invasion. In an attempt to do so, they constructed a 10-kilometer line of concrete blocks which would halt enemy tanks if necessary. Called the Toblerone Line as a result of its similarity to the famed Toblerone chocolate bar, the Swiss built 12 fortresses, including the Villas Rose and Verte. In fact, more than 100 similar false chalets were built throughout Switzerland. There is no aspect of these two seemingly innocent villas left unfortified behind the seven feet of concrete block. Today, Villa Rose and Villa Verte make a day trip destination, two sweet cottages hiding a secret in plain sight. Well, isn't that clever? Isn't it, though? We love to puzzle out things hidden in plain view, don't we, Walker? (laughs) And the more hidden or camouflaged, the more intriguing it is. Do you remember those 3D pictures that were so popular years ago? You stared at them with relaxed eyes and then suddenly an image would appear? Some people, though, never seem to get the knack for it. I love those. I couldn't get the image every time, but they were... Pretty cool. I'm a big fan of optical illusions as well. Is it a young woman or an old woman, a vase or two people facing each other, a blue or gold dress, you know? It boggles the mind a bit. Well, beyond the fun, the art of camouflage has real practical applications, both good and bad. Undoubtedly, camouflage is beneficial to the one hiding, but that is not the case for those searching and seeking for what is hidden. Perfectly put, Walker. The concept of camouflage comes from the French word camouflet, which means to disguise or to conceal. We can camouflage something or we can use camouflage to hide something. It can act as both a noun or a verb. It's a thing or an action. As a noun, it can be defined as leaves, branches, paints, and clothes for hiding soldiers or military equipment so that they can't be seen against the area around them. But in respect to animals and plants, it refers to the color or shape of an animal or plant that appears to mix with its natural environment to prevent it from being seen and attacked. It can also be defined as a behavior that is intended to hide the truth. I'm familiar with the first two, but the third? Yeah, I know. Here's an example from the comedian Rodney Dangerfield. It's a bit of a sad one, though. Comedy is a camouflage for depression. But definitely, military and camouflage in the natural world are more top of mind. Of course, camouflage has been around forever. Mm. In fact, the first reference to observe animal camouflage is a reference made by Aristotle in 350 BC. Oh, so cool. Look at you teaching me something about ancient Greek history. Not all bubbles in this head, Walker. (laughs) Apparently, Aristotle observed that an octopus could blend into its surroundings by changing its color. Neat. The octopus is a fascinating Mm -hmm. creature. Did you see that documentary, My Octopus Teacher? I did. Yeah, I think I've mentioned it before because I just love it. I don't know if you knew this, but the octopus has pigment containing cells called chromatophores in their skin. Their brain sends a signal to change the color and then the color ripples through their body, often mimicking their immediate surroundings. Octopi can also change the texture of their exterior so that they can take on the appearance of sand, rocks, and coral. And other cephalopods like squid and cuttlefish, they can do the same. It really is quite an amazing thing to watch. It is so super cool. Wouldn't it be so amazing if we had that skill, Walker? (laughs) Well, I was just thinking that as you were describing (laughs) the octopus. We could like (laughs) move around incognito. (laughs) Like when you're wearing your sweats, going to the coffee shop and an old boyfriend walks in. No makeup. Yeah, very, very. Very handy (laughs) techniques. There are, in fact, four ways that both plants and animals camouflage themselves. The most widely known is probably the fact that they naturally background match or blend into their background in respect to color, shape, or sometimes even both. 
This is obviously very helpful, but surprisingly can be less helpful than other forms of camouflage, according to zoologist Joanna Hall at the University of Bristol. If an animal needs to move through several habitats, they might stand out in Uh different environments. Yeah. And then there's disruptive coloration. Disruptive coloration refers to using patches of color to break the appearance of their outline. So think of a zebra standing in the midst of their herd. It makes it really difficult for potential predators to pick just one target out. A good defense measure for sure. Recent research also indicates that the stripes help to ward off flies. Did you know that? No, those stripes are doing double duty. (laughs) They are. The third type of camouflage is the masquerade. And this is when a living thing is indistinguishable from other objects, like a stone. I once saw two walking stick bugs on Lama Island in Hong Kong, and I would have thought that they were just forest debris, except they gave themselves away by having sexy time. Oh, my God. (laughs) I know. (laughs) And then there's also camouflage by decoration. Creatures gather materials from their surroundings to camouflage themselves. Octopi do this too. They cover themselves entirely with shells so they won't be detected by predators. And also some animals hide themselves by allowing algae or moss to grow on their bodies. Like sloths. They move so slowly that algae grows on their bodies, but it helps them to stay hidden in the treetops. Cute. The natural world is just beyond amazing, but geez, I don't like to be taken off Mm-mm. guard. Like those bugs that look like leaves. I know, ah. like my stick bug friends. I do love chameleons though. Their color shifts very slowly. Mm-hmm. A layer of pigment containing cells called iridophores are comprised of pigmented nanocrystals, which supposedly reflect the light. So crazy, right? It is. And what about those Arctic hares whose fur coats change color depending upon the season? So neat. Even more impressive is the Australian bird, the tawny frogmouth, known to stop all movement and pull in its feathers in order to impersonate a broken branch. Let me demonstrate for you, Walker. <laughs> Too bad we aren't on video there. <laughs> I know. According to Dr. Jolien Trosianko of the University of Exeter Center for Ecology and Conservation Department, we know that animal camouflage has evolved over millions of years to help prey evade being seen by predators. It is a classic example of natural selection. Mm-hmm, it is. I recently read a really interesting article in SITN, Science in the News, referencing a study conducted by the China Academy of Sciences. It was focused on a plant called Fritillaria devlavayi, which for 2,000 years has been used in traditional Chinese medicine. It actually sells for a whopping $218 per pound. Wow. Yeah, not cheap. This plant is green or brown, depending on where it's found. But what's interesting is that the plants are much more camouflaged in areas where the plant is harvested most. Researchers concluded that though the plant doesn't have any natural predators, they evolved over time to camouflage from people. But it's not always the prey that uses camouflage. It's also the predator. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Animals like tigers, leopards, and cheetahs have pattern coats that assist in breaking up the outline of their bodies, helping them blend into their environment and ultimately giving them the upper hand when they're sneaking up on their prey, Hmm. like the poor zebra who's using the same technique in slightly different way. And don't forget the beautiful polar bear. Their white coats make them virtually impossible to see against the snow. You know, I never really thought about it, but not all animals can actually see their predators the way we see them. Oh. In an article written by Kate Bagley, a regular contributor to popular science, Dr. Joanna Hall of the University of Bristol's Camel Lab explained that humans can see more colors than many animals. Hmm. So animals like tigers, which may seem bright and obvious to us, actually appear greenish to some prey. Wow, that's pretty good for the tiger, isn't it? Mm-hmm. It is good for the tiger. Well, there are all kinds of crazy types of camouflage out there in the wild. Don't I know it. There's a caterpillar in Ecuador that resembles a bird poo. Did you know that? (laughs) No, I can't see too many animals in a hurry to snatch up that little snack. Go look it up. (laughs) I will. Or the sphinx moth caterpillar. It literally looks like it's wearing the head of a snake. Yikes. It's like a bad Halloween costume. (laughs) Sometimes nature plays little pranks on us, though. On July 31st, a giraffe at the Bright Zoo in Limestone, Tennessee, was born without any ability to camouflage itself. Wow, that wouldn't be so funny in the wild, would it? It was born without spots. That's so unusual. It was. Apparently, there's only three other examples of this occurring, the last being in 1972 in Tokyo. There was actually a contest to help name the giraffe. Cute. So what would you name it, Walker? Oh, I'm not really sure. Um... 
I don't know, maybe Rudolph. The whole thing sort of reminds me of the reindeer story standing out from the rest of the reindeers. So maybe that. That's cute. Yeah, well, the name was announced on September 4th. The name is Kipiki, which means unique in Swahili. The hope is that the media attention surrounding this little curious giraffe will help highlight the declining number of giraffes in the wild, which they estimate to be a 30% drop in 30 to 35 years. Perhaps our guests can shed some light on the topic of camouflage for us, Harris. Today, we have the opportunity to expand our understanding of camouflage and more specifically, camouflage breaking with Dr. Jay Hegding, scientist in the Department of Neuroscience and Regenerative Medicine at Augusta University in Augusta, Georgia. Welcome to At Home and Abroad, Dr. Hegding. Thank you for having me. Now, could we start off perhaps with a definition of exactly what camouflage breaking is? This is a skill we have to learn. Is that correct? Correct. Camouflage is something that is visually hidden in plain view. Most of us have experienced, for instance, garden insects in in, in the bushes, um, and we don't see them until we see them. And this act of seeing a camouflaged object, be it a living animal or an inanimate object from its background, it's called camouflage breaking. It's more of a military term, but originally the the great scientists who studied it, uh, starting from uh, American naturalist Abbott Thayer, 19th century naturalist, he occasionally use this term as well, camouflage breaking, to mean recognizing camouflaged objects. And this is a skill that we have to learn? It doesn't come naturally to us? Correct. It seems like it comes naturally to us because we don't realize that we actually have to have learned the objects that we see. This is a fact about vision that is not specific to camouflage breaking, although there are some aspects of camouflage breaking that specifically require learning. I'll get to it in a moment. But as a general matter, in order to visually recognize something, we'll have to have learned what it looks like. We don't realize we have to learn it because we naturally have learned it during development. So it was only recently by studying people who were congenitally visually impaired, congenitally blind, then the vision was restored later in life, usually surgically. People realized they had actually trouble recognizing anything, even though their vision, the the visual apparatus was working fine, is because of this process. They hadn't had a chance to have gone through this learning to see, even though all their hardware, visual hardware, was once again, due to the magic of surgery, was working. So that is one aspect of learning, that in order to recognize any visual object, you'll have to have learned what it looks like. The aspect of learning that is specific to camouflage is that we discovered in our laboratory, somewhat accidentally, that in order to break camouflage of an object, In other words, in order to recognize a camouflage object, you also have to have learned the background. So that way, you have to have learned what the camouflage object looks like and what the background looks like. We also showed that just to see that there's something odd man art, something in the camouflage scene that doesn't belong there, just to pick out the odd man out, you don't have to really have learned the camouflage object, which we have scientifically shown. We have digitally created visual scenes in which we created 3D objects that we knew the test subjects were guaranteed never to have seen in their lives before. And we camouflage them against a background, naturalistic background, say uh, foliage or or sand or uh, pebbles, etc., And then we taught them only what the background looks like, nothing about what the foreground camouflaged object looks like. And lo and behold, before they learned what the background looked like, they performed the task 
at chance levels. In, in other words, they couldn't recognize it at all. But once they learned what the background looks like, they were extremely good at recognizing that something in the visual scene, a camouflage object in the visual scene. This was a good finding and somewhat surprising finding because it suggested a way of training, say, snipers uh, mm-hmm. to be expert camouflage breakers because the first thing is you have to recognize that in the scene, there's something that you need to look at, something that doesn't belong, even though it is, you know, the enemy might have done a great job of camouflaging it. That's how you pick out. And so that was a a useful and surprising insight for us. And that's how we know that in order to break camouflage, you have to learn to break camouflage. That is so interesting. And I don't think I've ever thought about camouflage in that way, even just basically to think that we would have to learn how to break those patterns, but even going further between the background and the object themselves. So what exactly is going on in our brains when we are camouflage breaking? So that was um, another set of uh, studies done in our lab. The work was mostly spearheaded by my postdoctoral trainee, Dr. Shin Chen and Donatello Arienzo. And what we did was we took people off the street who knew nothing about camouflage breaking. When they started out, they were as poor as anybody else at breaking camouflage. And then using the methodology that I mentioned, they learned to break camouflage where they did it extremely well. They did it over 99% of the case, they were able to successfully break camouflage. Once we train the subjects this way, we put them in an MRI machine, the, the brain scan, so that we were able to observe the brain in action during camouflage breaking. So we simply asked the question of what is different when the camouflage breaking experts break camouflage versus they failed to break camouflage. And that revealed that when we break camouflage, there are, as you can imagine, a large number of brain areas participate in camouflage breaking. We identified 29 different distinct brain regions all over different parts of the brain, starting from the parts in the back toward the back of the head, that are devoted more or less purely to the act of seeing, as well as other regions and other lobes of the brain, such as near the temples, near the the front of the head, the frontal lobe, where brain regions are involved in making decisions and coming up with inferences. So all these regions work in tandem during camouflage breaking, but there was a specific And once again, surprising insight that we got. When the camouflage breakers were successfully breaking camouflage, these 29 brain regions acted as a so-called rich club. I'll explain that to you in a moment. The same subjects, same brain regions, the same set of images. In other words, there was nothing different. The only difference was, by chance, the camouflage experts failed to see the camouflage objects, the same brain regions fail to act like rich clubs. And what are rich clubs? Uh, Rich clubs are the type of brain activity when highly interconnected brain regions talk to other highly interconnected brain regions. So that was the hallmark of successfully camouflage breaking this rich club operation, the same set of brain regions, but when the highly interconnected regions were able to talk to each other successfully. The subject was able to break camouflage when, for whatever reason, this conversation, this talking among the brain regions didn't work, then the subjects failed. And do you have any idea or are there a myriad of things that could contribute to that rich club not integrating and speaking to each other? Right now, we don't know why. And there's a practical reason 
why it, it, it's a hard question to get at. Remember, I told you before, the camouflage experts break camouflage 99% of the time, which means you just don't have enough data points to figure out what exactly happened when the camouflage breaking was unsuccessful. In other right. words, it's the paucity of data that is currently preventing us from figuring out exactly what went wrong. Even if we have a lot of data, we expect it to be a tough nut to crack. But right now, we don't know the answer uh, to that question. It's a good question. The next frontier then. That's right. It's a nature of science. You know, you answer some questions, it naturally raises more questions. It's good for us as scientists because it gives us something to do. Uh, <laughs> And it gives you a pretext for ask for more grant money to do research. But it is an important question. Most of this research was funded by the U.S. Army. for They are interested in it for obvious reasons. But the camouflage breaking is also of interest in, in a wide variety of other fields, such as game hunting or radiologists, for instance. They When they look at images, for instance, say a mammographist looks at, say, mammograms, or a radiologist looks at chest x-rays and looks for signs of cancer, it is quite literally kind of like looking for a needle in a haystack. So you have to be an expert. You have to do essentially what camouflage breakers do. All of that is to say there are many implications of this camouflage research Mm -hmm. Being a good camouflage breaker has real important applications in the world. I'm just wondering if you could talk a little bit about whether your research identifies what makes a good camouflage breaker. It's a great question and something that we have spent a whole lot of time looking into. Because for one thing, it is of interest for everybody to figure out what makes a good sniper, what makes a good camouflage breaker in a military setting, say, for instance, a, a soldier who has to scan the path of, say, marching troops for buried landmines, or what makes a good radiologist who is successful at finding hidden cancers, a medical image that most people otherwise won't see. The short answer is here, we don't have a whole lot of answers, but we have some leads. And the part of the, the reason why we don't have good answers is both in radiology and in the military, a lot of this is self-selection. In other words, people did not know what made a good radiologist with, you know, good set of eyes, what made a good sniper. It's a lot of it was, it was self-selection. It still is mostly people thought they were good at something. They wanted to do it. And it was basically trial by fire. There still is very little predictive about what makes a good camouflage breaker that's slowly changing. A colleague of mine, Steve Mitroff of George Washington University, looked at airport baggage scanners and they're trying to figure out, is there something that predicts what makes a good baggage scanner good at figuring out contraband in a airport baggage because it is a very similar type of exercise as camouflage break. It is a form of camouflage breaking, although the camouflage is not quite as strong as we in our laboratory situations make it to be. The short answer is nobody exactly knows what makes a good camouflage breaker. There's uh, some trend in our data that suggests Women in general are better at breaking camouflage, although that trend is not yet statistically significant. It, it is possible that it is a very subtle trend and you have to collect data from thousands, perhaps even tens of thousands of people for that subtle effect to rise to the level of a statistically significant effect. We don't know, but that hasn't stopped women in my lab and women in my uh, in my family from claiming that this has got to be an intelligence-based effect because women are better at camouflage breaking and, and men are not. Uh, but, you know, even in a laboratory of science, scientific evidence goes only so far. So we have stopped arguing. 
for that, uh, arguing that point. Well, I, I certainly have enough men in my life who have asked me to look for things. And some of these things are like looking for a needle in a haystack. So well, maybe there is something to that. I thought maybe we could circle back just for a second because I'm curious, you had mentioned radiologists and I'm just wondering how camouflage breaking compares with that. Can you can you talk a little bit about that? The skills, are they identical? Do they differ in what way? In a lot of ways that count, finding a hidden, say, or a hard to see tumor in a medical image is very similar to camouflage breaking. We have, in fact, done a series of tests. In fact, we have tested practicing radiologists and expert camouflage breakers and ordinary non-professional, non-expert subjects, etc. And we know that the basic functioning of the brain or the basic behavioral pattern of camouflage breakers and expert radiologists is very, very similar. But we also know that an expert radiologist does not necessarily make an expert camouflage breaker and vice versa. Now, we have a pretty good idea as to why. If you recall, I mentioned to you before, you'll have to learn to break camouflage to, in order to break the, the camouflage. You have to have learned to recognize an object in order to recognize the object. And it turns out that learning doesn't transfer very well. To put it in very uh, simplistic term, if you learn to recognize an apple, you don't necessarily get to rec- use that to recognize an orange and vice versa. The underlying principle is it's very similar, except that what they're trying to recognize uh, are even much more different than apples and oranges. Other than these differences in what it is that they're recognizing hidden against what kind of background, the basic processes involved in recognizing hidden objects of interest seems to be very similar. In fact, one of the both gratifying and surprising things that we have seen is that if you do similar experiments using expert camouflage breakers and expert radiologists, and you laid out the data in a similar format, but you didn't tell others which data was which, the data looks so identical, it's, in fact, easy to confuse one set of data for other. That's how, how similar these processes are. I wanted to talk before we go today about our mental state and whether biases might affect our ability to be a camouflage breaker, and if so, in what way? Our uh, research initially focused on what it is in the image that contributes to successful or unsuccessful camouflage breaking. But as we all know, there's more to seeing than what meets the eye, what is just in the image. So that naturally led us into looking at what mental capacities or our biases contribute to camouflage breaking, which is, this is again of great interest in many, many fields. And there's a, a line of research started in the 1960s by the Nobel Prize winning economist Herbert Simon that started this whole field of how mental states contribute to decision-making and camouflage breaking, recognizing camouflage object is a difficult form of decision-making where you're operating based on information that is mostly ambiguous. The, there's a great deal of uncertainty and often there's risk. So there's a great deal of research that started with Herbert Simon and carried on by landmark studies by Amos Traversky and, and Daniel Kahneman They had shown that there are mental processes, biases, they call heuristics or mental rules of thumb that people use when they have to make decisions under uncertainty, risk, or ambiguity. And we said, wait, there's this great wealth of research that's already sitting there that speaks to how people make decisions and how their mental states affect difficult decisions that have to be made under scenarios that are that is very similar to camouflage breaking because camouflage breaking that I mentioned involves ambiguity, uncertainty, risks, and all that. And so the previous research, most notably by Traversky and Kahneman, has identified specific mental tricks or mental 
rules of thumb or mental shortcuts that we all use when you have to make quick and dirty decisions like that. They have identified several of these mental tricks, and we systematically looked at whether and to what extent one or more of these mental tricks affect camouflage breaking or a recognition of tumors by a radiology, a practicing radiologist in a medical event. And the short answer is these have a tremendous effect. I'll give you one example. Tversky and Kahneman identified a mental shortcut or what they call a heuristic called anchoring and adjustment heuristic. That simply refers to decision making, quick and dirty decision making when you don't go through painstaking assessment of all the data. You home in on one piece of information and ma- make a decision like that. A, a similar heuristic applies when you have kind of like a starting position, an initial bias, mm-hmm. and we don't realize it, but it ends up affecting our eventual decision. Okay. And so... We did a simple experiment in which we took trained expert camouflage breakers who were able to break camouflage highly successfully. And we we told them, we're going to show you camouflage image. But before that, we can tell you that another camouflage breaker looked at it and he or she came up with the following probability that the image that you're going to see has a camouflage object hidden in it. And we said, so before we show the image, what do you think the chances are that the upcoming image will have a hidden camouflage object? That is our way of measuring what their initial bias was, initial starting position one. And then we showed them the camouflage object, the camouflage scene, and asked them the same question. Now you have seen the camouflage image. Now what is your estimate that the image has a camouflage object in it? And the surprising part was, even though these were highly trained, successful, highly accurate camouflage breakers, they went with their initial impression or the, uh, what they've been told, what the other camouflage breaker had determined. They overrode their own visual evidence, their own lying eyes. They were influenced. They're biased. That's right. Yeah. And then we said, okay, Maybe the, these people just temporarily lost their minds, forgot how to do this. Right. And so we did a, another experiment in which in, in randomly interleaved trials, some trials, we gave them the biasing initial information. And other trials, we said, oh, the, there was no initial information available. Exact same images, exact same everything. And the camouflage breakers, were highly successful when there was no biasing information given to them. But when the biasing information was available, they went with the biasing information, even though everything else was the same. And so this this was so surprising that the effect of our mental states can be so strong as to make us override or or mentally veto what is right in front of our eyes. This is obviously of great interest to the military because this is something that they want to avoid. And we said, okay, does this happen to radiologists? The short answer is yes, it does. We have shown that practicing radiologists, if they're told a previous radiologist looked at it and came up with a a number, even though it is a completely made up number, they went with the earlier quote unquote, um, radiologist estimate than their own expertise. And once again, when this biasing information was not available, these are practicing radiologists. They're extremely accurate. And in fact, they can identify a a tumor in a mammogram if you show them for a 50 millisecond, that is one twentieth of a second, they can see it looks cancerous. So they're that accurate. But even if you let them look at it ad libitum for well, for unlimited length of time, if the biasing information available was available, they're likely to override what what their eyes were telling them. Now, having said that, this this is a contrived laboratory experiment meant to show the biases can be so strong. That is not to say it happens to this extent 
in actual camouflage breaking or in, in radiology, it is to make the point that in principle, the biases can be very strong. We are currently in the process of measuring exactly what the level of effect of biases are in radiology and mammography and other fields of radiology. This is absolutely fascinating. I've certainly learned a lot here today. I want to thank you very much, Dr. Hegde, for being with us today. As I said, it's a, it's been quite an illuminating conversation. If you would like to learn more about Dr. Hegde's research, you can follow his work at the Hegde Laboratory at www.hegde.us. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for having me. I enjoyed it. That was so interesting. I'd never thought of camouflage in that way before. Clearly, the purpose of camouflage in a military application is the same as with animals, Mm -hmm. like soldiers and their equipment blending into their surroundings without being detected by the enemy. I came across an article in which military camouflage was described as the symbolic representation of freedom, power, and purpose. Well, that is a powerful statement, but camouflage uniforms do sort of have that association, don't they? Especially since it's a uniform of many of the men and women who fight for our freedom. Yeah, I guess that makes sense. But soldiers weren't always dressed in camouflage wear, were they? I'm thinking of those very identifiable and obvious British redcoats. Right. The French were easily identified too by their blue uniforms. Exactly. Well, Adrienne Reynolds in her article, Camouflage, the Art of Hiding in Plain Sight, said that the brightly colored uniforms today tend to be for ceremonial purposes like parades and other formal celebrations. It was as early as the 19th century that some countries were dressing their soldiers in muted single colored uniforms, but it wasn't really until the First World War that camouflage became increasingly important. It became quickly apparent that soldiers needed to be hidden from the new weapons that could shoot from long distances or from planes above. A very new type of war then, right? Yes. According to UF Pro, a manufacturer of tactical clothing for law enforcement and the military at the beginning of World War I, France was the last country still using easily spotted uniforms. Wow, really? Supposedly, it was French artists and theater set designers who created ways to hide everything, including vehicles and structures. Even paper mache heads were used to encourage the enemy to misdirect their fire. Wow, that's so cool. But it makes sense, doesn't it? Yes, apparently they learned from Mother Nature and used disruptive patterns on the vehicles and camouflage nets to disguise their troops and movements. So by World War II, printed camouflage material was common and many countries eventually developed their own patterns going forward. These were often determined by the environment in which the soldiers were fighting, which makes sense. Clearly, fighting in a forest would require different uniforms than would be required in desert or the snow. Mm -hmm. I have to say, I was shocked at the number of camouflage patterns that have come into use over time. Yeah, and it's even infiltrated big fashion. Well, we could spend all day talking about different camouflage patterns in use by different countries. The British popularized the DPM, meaning disruptive pattern material, which has four colors mimicking twigs and leaves, such as would be seen in a woodland environment. Okay. People might even be more familiar with the chocolate chip pattern or the six-color desert with muted brown and tan colors, which would make it a viable option for desert combat. It was used during the first U.S. Gulf War. Mm -hmm. And most recently, there's been the development of digital camouflage. What on earth is digital camouflage? It's camouflage patterns that are pixelated, like in Minecraft. Oh, wow. And did you know that there's an online camo encyclopedia? Wow, I'm shocked that I haven't come across it. It's called (laughs) Camopedia. (laughs) On their website, it is referred to as a living document providing a comprehensive, accurate, and academically supported database referring to all of the major military and paramilitary camouflage patterns that have been in use around the world since the beginning of the 20th century. Wow, that's actually kind of cool. Uh-huh. And I'm not exaggerating when I say it's really worth checking out. The site is organized by continent and then some divided into countries and then each country's camouflage patterns are included with additional relative details. Okay, well, I think we should link that in the show notes. Uh, this is a massive of undertaking to have gathered all this information. Camopedia also welcomes people to contribute as well. Oh, that's cool. Mm -hmm. So we've mentioned that netting and painting are two additional methods of camouflaging soldiers and their equipment, but there are also other pretty unusual forms of camouflage which have been put into use by the military. Such as? Did you 
know that the Office of Strategic Services, also known as the OSS, had a chemist create an explosive that could be disguised as flour and get this, you could bake with it too. Isn't that super cool spycraft? Come on. Yeah. And it was a combination of three parts explosive and one part flour. Although it could be baked, it wasn't obviously fit for consumption at first. But later, a mixture was created that could be consumed. Okay. That's really cool. I know. The French also were said to be the first to disguise artillery and sniper observation posts as trees during World War I. The soldier used a periscope while on top to determine what was going on. Cool. But like I said, camo is not any longer just associated with the natural world or the military. Camouflage fabrics have been adopted by hunters and the fashion world equally. According again to UF Pro, the differences between detecting humans in a military scenario versus the uses of camouflage when hunting are very different. Humans are detected in military operations by way of visual, sound, near-infrared, and thermal methods. Mm -hmm. But in the case of hunting, prey would also detect humans visually or by sound and scent. Okay. Like I mentioned before, animals do not see as many colors as humans, and they certainly don't see as clearly at a distance. So hunters need to worry less about being spotted. Also, they don't tend to move around like soldiers do, right? So different camouflage is required for different purposes. Now, I have to say that camouflage is anything but subtle in the fashion world, though, right, Harris? So true. Camouflage entered fashion in the 1980s, and it looks like it's here to stay. I just bought gray camo joggers for my daughter at Costco the other day. Well, it's quite ironic, though, isn't it? It's a fabric intended to conceal but it's been reinvented to stand out. Quite. Do you own any camo or have you owned any yourself? Uh, I had like an army jacket in grade eight, but that was like vintage military. Right. But other than that, I think I might have an old pair of leggings that I use for garden work. What about you? Um, I've owned a couple of pair of pants over the years, but that's it. Although blending in may not be top of mind by the camo clad fashion minded folk over the years, There are more jobs than you might think where blending into the background can be a requirement. Think secret shoppers, food critics, wildlife photographers, private detectives, to name just a few. Cool. I wonder what it would be like to have a job that requires you to be incognito. Well, I would think that it would take a toll on an individual, right? Pretty isolating, maybe. Like the witness protection program, right? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Or those in hiding during war, your safety requires you to leave your old life behind and go into hiding with a new identity. Yeah, that must be so hard. So that's pretty extreme, but it still would be tough if camouflage was part of your daily life. Yeah, I've often wondered what the psychological effects would be. Clearly being a secret shopper or food critic would not have the same psychological side effects that a combat soldier would experience or even a spy, for instance. Yeah, absolutely. In an article for Vice, David Will dove into the topic in more detail. Okay. He interviewed a wildlife photographer, a detective, and a soldier who trained reconnaissance soldiers. In the case of the soldier, he stated that camouflage was really critical for soldiers who were out on patrol or charting enemy territory. Uh, Yeah, of course. Mm -hmm. For this soldier, his camouflage consisted of a camo suit, makeup, branches, etc. And it could also require being buried in the ground, sometimes for multiple days at a time if enemy soldiers are in close proximity. And they would have to remain silent too, I would imagine, right? Yes, talking is kept to a minimum. One thing that I hadn't thought of was disposing of food in personal ways. That's all part of it too. He said leaving no trace is part of the camouflage. Wow. Yeah, he revealed that it could be boring, but also challenging and explained that if your attention drops for just a moment, it doesn't only affect you, but also your unit or your commanding officer. That has got to be so stressful. A lot of pressure. Right? Waiting on pins and needles, silent day in and day out with your life and other people's lives on the line. I would think so. Crazy. I can't imagine it being as stressful, though, for a wildlife photographer. Right. The wildlife photographer stated, I become part of the natural environment in a special way. I'm a human being, but I can transform into a tree. It's breathtaking to see how close animals get to me when I'm in disguise. So he might be using similar techniques like disguising himself with branches and twigs, But it's a very different experience. Very different. Again, silence would be important, though. And I know this from experience. Like, nature walks seldom involved wildlife sightings when my kids were small because they were so noisy. 
<laughs> right. The photographer also mentioned, too, that he must be free of scent. He even has to air out his clothes for a couple days before going into hiding. Can you imagine? Yeah, well, it makes sense. But the camouflage suit is the last thing you want to wear if you're a private detective. As Herma Kloon explained to David Wheel, looking like a regular person is the best way to stay undetected. Yeah, but it still must be kind of tricky, though. Right. She says she wears wigs and layers her clothes under coats. Ah, I see. Okay, so looking different, but still not standing out. I knew a private detective when I was younger, but it just seemed like a lot of waiting around, just like these other jobs. Oh, you got it. The private detective said that the act of disappearing is in my blood. Like a magical act. So let me leave us with this to ponder, Walker. In the words of Russell Lines, American art historian, photographer, author, and managing editor of Harper's Magazine, camouflage is a game we all like to play. But our secrets are as surely revealed by what we want to seem to be as by what we want to conceal. Thank you for joining us at At Home and Abroad with your host, Harrison Walker. If you enjoyed this episode, we would really appreciate it if you would rate and review our show. It helps us grow and expand our reach. Subscribe to follow us each week as we continue the conversation. You can also say hi to us on Instagram at at Harrison Walker. We would love to hear from you.